these sea change forces can change the industry completely on a dime and leave us looking at entirely new portfolios of technology as the right way to go. I think we're seeing that we're in the cusp of one of those changes right now. Big data is a term that gets used. I don't like the term. It's overused. It means too many things. It happens to be spot on technically accurate. The problem is we have massive amounts of data. But big data doesn't say to me, why the hell do I care? The question is, why do you care about big data? There's two reasons. One is, you have to archive off everything and keep it, because someday you might get hauled into court, and I need to know what your email said to that person down the hall that we think you may have been trying to uh, have an illicit relationship with, if that ever happened to you, hypothetically speaking, of course. Uh, but that, that's an archival problem. That's not really what big data is here to provide. And what we are seeing is that big data delivers its value when we couple it with the ability to predict what might happen next, whether that's a minute from now, an hour from now, or heaven forbid, a month from now. The problem with that is that prediction requires two views. You have to know what happened over the last period of time, a year, five years. You have to know a massive amount of detail about those so that you can unleash a class of mathematics called predictive analytics on the data to produce what we call in the industry a model. Well, to me, a model is plastic, and you put little stickers on it, and you got the glue all over your fingers. Nobody can build a model at once. We're not talking about that. A model to someone in the statistics business is the result of a calculation that predicts an outcome. A model in the case of a linear regression You've all seen it, the stock chart with all the stock prices on it, and there's a line drawn right through the middle. The line is a mathematical equation. It says it starts at 2.3 on the at the zero point on the x-axis and rises at a slope of x, and most of the data falls in near that line. So that was a first approximation of a predictive model. If you knew where on the x you were, you could get to where the average was likely to be a variable y. Well, that was 50 years ago. Now take that forward, 50 years of mathematics and science and statistics, and you get the field that exists today, which is a rapid, rapid sea change in nearly every industry that is not only changing all the industries that we see today, but it's also creating entirely new industries. How many of you get a little weirded out when you go on Amazon and you look for something for your house? And then you go over onto Facebook, five minutes later, and an ad pops up. One of the largest areas of consumption of computer technology and production of revenue in American business today are the ad exchanges that do that work in real time. And they are all based on big data and very groundbreaking statistics and mathematics to generate those predictions, generate them quickly, load those predictions into uh, what are called ad exchanges, which are real-time uh, real brokering software that uh, the moment you click that you're in Facebook, Facebook fires a message to the exchange and says, it's Orlin Cannon from ACM, and he just visited this, and he used these keywords, and the ad exchange will immediately run predictive models that say, Orlin is probably very likely to buy bags of peanuts. Okay, teasing it, you know. But the reality is, that's what's going on. These, this is a huge, that's a billion dollar business plus right there. Just the guy, you don't see them, they're invisible. And there are many, many, many others. Clickstream and campaign, campaign analysis is another place where we see this, but the clickstreams are the primary engine behind those ad exchanges. We've all, of course, been exposed to sentiment analysis, you know, we, we don't realize it. How many of you fly on Southwest Airlines? This is Dallas after all. All right. How many of you have a drink coupon from Southwest Airlines in your pocket? Anybody know where that drink coupon came from? Southwest Airlines monitors what you say when you call them. And you say, I'm pissed. You guys dumped me off and I didn't have a seat. And there was a fly in my beer and yada, yada, yada. They don't give you what you want on Southwest. But as predictable as the sun coming up in the morning, if they detected the words you used, frustration or anger, you'll get four drink coupons in a week. This you used to. They probably got wise to guys like me telling everybody, call me and gripe a little bit to get some drink coupons. 
It's an example of sediment analysis. They are detecting what your feelings are about their company and using that to make their marketing decisions. Telcos are doing it. You get a bunch of drop calls on your cell phone bill or on your cell phone. If, if Verizon drops your calls a few times, they know they've done it. Next time you call in, you might get a little better discount program if you just asked. Okay? So great examples of sentiment analysis. Most of these things are very horizontal, occurring in all businesses. Y'all love the progressive ad, right? Plug our little dongle into your kid's car. We'll find out if we can get them a cheaper insurance rate. Fantastic example of big data predictive analytics. They're measuring the number of G's around the corner, the acceleration rates of the car, how many miles you're driving, where you're driving, and then they match that with who you are and what you're driving. Because historically, your auto insurance was rated on your credit history. Well, I know some guys who pay all their bills and they're wild asses behind the wheel. They're called senior sales guys. No offense to my buddy Tom. So wait, where's your hand, Tom? He actually is a good driver. We let him drive last night when we went out. But the fact is, the insurance industry went from this very poor predictor of your driving habits, began to absorb this, what's called telematic data, what you're, what you're doing in the vehicle. And when they marry those two things together, they get an explosive, exponential improvement in their ability to predict your risk as an insured. And the list goes on. We see it in every industry that we talk to, and we talk to all the industries. Tom, uh, very experienced in oil and gas and analytics and a bunch of things, is calling and has relatives that work at Shell. Turns out Shell has an entire floor in a big building. Jump in if I get it wrong here, Tom. In a big building down in Houston, and these people do nothing but monitor pumps. Why? Think about offshore drilling and pumps. Hmm. How many pumps on an offshore rig? I don't know the number, but I know it's big. Moreover, let's think about the business value. Pumps are expensive. They require maintenance. When the pump's being maintained, some subsystem is not working. If the pump craps out because it didn't get maintained, you've got an even worse problem on your hands, perhaps explosion and fire. Let's go back to Three Mile Island. That was a cooling system failure. So e even in industries right here in Dallas, down in Houston, we're seeing complete new applications of predictive analytics. In the case of the, the pump watchers, the pump watchers are tracking where the pumps are, how they've been maintained, how they're performing, how all the pumps from that vendor are performing, and how pumps perform when they're put under a certain kind of service load for a period of time. And from that, they can predict the crossover point of maintain it too much, and it costs a lot, and maintain it too little, and up here on the high point of the risk curve, something blows up. So you want to be right in the valley of the curve. Well, that's, that's a great application. That's a predictive analytics application. These are the key uses of big data. Okay? And that's kind of what we do. Now, um, the more data you get, the more you got a hold of, the more things you can see with these statistical algorithms, the better your predictions are likely to be, assuming you don't blow something. So here's a retail example. In the retail industry, what you'll find is, <laughs> Retailers are trying to touch every touch point of the customer, everything they know about the customer from other sources, everything the customer has ever bought from them and any other vendors they can figure out, hence the crossover problem of looking at something on Amazon and it pops up over in Facebook. That's looking at the other guy's work if you can buy it. How many of you use a grocery store card, a loyalty card? I love those discounts, man. One of the biggest data warehouses in North America is actually a place called Catalina Marketing. Catalina Marketing was a massive big data facility down in Florida and a few other places. And what they do is they capture everything you ever bought in the grocery store. And they track that. That's why that's free. They're giving you free money. I'm going to give you this card. You just use this card. I'll give you discounts. Look at how much money they are giving away to get you to use that card. They must be learning quite a lot from that data. Indeed, they are. And it comes through Catalina Marketing. And so they capture every touch of every customer, every transaction. In many businesses, they want to know which employee helped you. Because if you can figure out which employees are generating happy customers and which employees are generating bad customers, like United Airlines and some of their stewardesses, that's why I fly Southwest, if they knew, they would probably know that they want to get rid of some people. So on down the list, that is what's going on. This is why big data is big. It's because the more different, unrelated types of data you can pull together, the better your predictions are going to be. Anybody ever had their gene panel done? Take a cheek swab, a little swab stick, and send it down to the lab? They pull 30, 
30 gigabytes of data or something like that off of one cheek swab. It's a huge number. And from that, they can tell a huge amount of things about your proclivity for disease. Now, I don't ever want my health insurer knowing that. I want to know that. In my family, history of celiac disease. A few wackos that didn't do so well on the, on the mental stability check. Um, diabetes. All these things factor in all of our families in some way. And we may never know that, but in five or ten years, we'll get these as routine tests. And these are going to create huge data farms from which we can predict things. The challenge is this. Once you have all the data, you can do lots of stuff. What are you going to do? Well, think about it this way. We've done a, a, a long stint in the industry, probably from about 1985 forward to now, creating massive capabilities in traditional business intelligence to take what happened, look at it in the rearview mirror, and why did it happen? Did we sell more? Did we not sell more? Et cetera. The move now with big data and advanced analytics over massive fields of data is to, pardon me, we're all married, right? Wives. <laughs> It's me that didn't turn the button off. Um, to go to a place where we can build analytics that are predictive in the sense that they give us some view into the future. And the better we do it, the farther we can see. The headlamps get brighter as we gather more data. To a point where combining business knowledge and predictive analytics gives us the ability for what we call proscriptive, prescriptive analytics. Not only what's going to happen, but have a pre-planned course of action of what to do about it. Hi, Southwest. I'm really peeved. You know, you bumped me off a flight, yada, yada, yada. That's predictive analytics. He's angry. Prescriptive analytics is we know that if we send everybody four drink coupons within a week, their average tendency to go use another airline drops by a certain amount. And so they have a prescribed course of action. When somebody's angry, send them drink coupons. That sounds simplistic. But drink coupons are a pretty cheap investment in customer sat. And this, this, the examples of this. So this is what big data is about. We are on the horns of a couple of trends that are making this a possibility, and it's why you guys are all here. So before I go into this, I want to find out who you guys are. How many of you are data scientists? How many of you want to become a data scientist? Does anybody want to know what a data scientist does? Our, our, our edition of data science is, data science is the collision of math and stats, formal software development, and hacking to get those two married together. And if you find, it's an interesting field. I met with a gardener analyst, a, kind of a senior guy named Merv Avery, a very good guy. And he sat down, this is a year and a half ago at Hadoop, and he says, I just had the funniest conversation. He said, I just met with a CIO I've known for years, and he said to me, quote, I have never paid so much blood money for an individual contributor in my entire career. That was the end of the quote. I got the impression that he had just paid something like a quarter of a million dollars a year to hire one data scientist. And there's this, that's kind of ameliorating a bit. But this, this field that is so in demand for tackling these big, hard prediction problems using science and math and hacking and software is generate a whole new field of endeavor. So programming, math and stats, and hacking. Interesting combination. That's kind of the general definition of data scientists. And there are gray data scientists and blue data scientists, and some that are more math and stats, and some that are more uh, programmer types. And there's a bunch of flavors. But this is the field that is garnering the most attention in the industry. And what's happening is, of course, cloud computing is giving us a massive increase in capacity. Why is this important? Well, storage is expensive, right? More importantly, look at all these cool applications. I'm driving down the road, I'm driving my Jimmy and Han stars up here in my, where's that data coming from? It's born in the cloud. That data starts in a telecom network and probably ends in a cloud. Never winds up behind somebody's firewall. When I'm clicking around a website, where's that data starting? It's happening on a website probably in the cloud. And so a lot of what the cloud represents is an opportunity to expand the number of data sources. But those data sources are so damn big, you don't want to build architectures where you're going to try and suck all that data down inside your data center. You probably can't imagine ways to build out your data center that fast. And so we're seeing this massive explosion of cloud vendors, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and others. 
Second major trend, of course, is data explosion. We've explained a lot of the, the cases that are causing that. The third one is an emergence of open source platforms, and this is that linebacker who clipped our guy who's running down the field uh, and brought in technologies like Hadoop. How many of you are Hadoop users? Anybody used Hadoop yet? If I hand out, if I put a $20 bill in a marker up here and said, draw me a picture of what Hadoop does, how many of you could actually pin out these are the steps that Hadoop uses? Good, I see you smile. Well, may, I may ask you to do that. Hadoop is a massively parallel computing platform that was developed inside of companies like Facebook to help them grapple with data explosion and be able to run things in big clouds of commodity uh, server technology. And then the last piece addresses the blood money problem. Has anybody here ever programmed in a language called R? <coughs> oh, really? I'm surprised. How many of you are regular R programmers do this every day? A little bigger numbers than I expected. Well, R is an interesting piece of software innovation. How many of you think R is really a hot language? It's the latest, greatest way to build really sophisticated apps. It's not. R is visual basic for statisticians, and every time I say that, the R bigots in my company blow steam out their ears. I'm not an R programmer. It's a simple enough language I can read it, and that's actually part of its, part of its advantage. Well, we're gonna tell you all about R, we'll tell you about how to use R with Hadoop, we're gonna tell you how, about, how to use R with Hadoop and some commercial products to achieve the kind of scale you need to grapple with the idea explosion, okay? But these are the trends that are at work. And the effect it's had on the industry, we all know about these languages, right? Languages come and go in about a 10 year, five year, 10 year life cycle. Look who's creeping up behind. I mean, this is, this is the Kentucky Derby, this unknown horse leapt the fence, snuck into the pack when nobody was looking, and came running up from behind, and is sitting at number nine. All the rest of these are general purpose software languages. Nothing else in there is a language that's specifically designed for one purpose. R is, and look where it stands. The reason for that is this growth of big data and a predictive analytics problem. So what's R? Many years ago, uh, AT&T Bell Labs created a language called? Yes. Ding, da, ding, 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 ding. Got some guys here know the history. Created this language for statisticians, called it S. Like AT&T was wont to do, always, and why they no longer own Unix and the Linux world is they tried to make too much money off of it when it was too important to the industry. Two guys said to hell with that. And they went off and wrote a work-alike called R. Robert, gentleman, was one of the guys. And Ross Ahaka. I wonder how they came up with that number, the letter R is the name of this thing. Huh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so they built a work-alike in the S language and formed a working group around it. Put the whole thing in open source and by about 2000 had the basics of the language done. So, who, who's, you guys, put your hands up again. R programmers. What's the one thing that's really different about R compared to all of the languages? The lang no, you're cheating, you're going ahead. You st you're stealing my next slide, you can't do that. The language itself, what's unique about the language itself? It's easy to analyze the data. Why is it easy to analyze the data? You don't have to write tons of code to do it. What's the one thing you should never expect to do in R? Write a loop. What do you do in C if you want to go through an array or a matrix? You write a loop. Yeah. R has all that stuff implicitly in the language. You want to invert a matrix in R, you say, invert the matrix. Yeah. Those kinds of things. So it is a language that is kind of, like I said, visual, visual basic on steroids for stats. And if you think about it in that, you get, you get your brain around it. Anybody who's programmed in any other language can pick R up very quickly, all except for the nuances. You can always tell an old C guy who comes over and tries to use R, he puts loops in his code and all the R guys just chuckle and say, you know, I can do your 300 line script in two lines and just watch here, do it this way. So it's, a, it's an interesting language in that regard. Um, so since you were cheating and taking my next slide, I'm wondering if you have x-ray vision into my hard drive. Um, but what R really is, uh, it's just a language, right? You can do the same things in Python and Scala and all these other languages. But what follows R around because of 15 years of very rapid adoption in the open source community is a huge number of users. Two years ago, we put it at about two and a half million as best we could figure it out. Um, about, uh, about half of the uh, math and stats programs we run into in North America actually use R as a teaching vehicle. They teach math and stats using R as the language of choice. And so that means that when you go out to hire 
If you wind up in the predictive analytics and stats business uh, and someone says you've got to do a project and you've got this choice between a legacy analytics package like a SAS, a SAS or an SPSS or R, and you go out and look at the, the resumes you'll get, your average SAS programmer, when we look at the numbers, is about 40 or 50 years old. I don't remember the exact number. Greg, do you? It's way up around 50. It's, it's younger guys than me, but not a hell of a lot younger than me. And if you look at the average age of our programmers, present company excluded apparently, there's a few of us uh, who have got a little experience in know R, but the, the, the average age of our program is about 26 or 27. That equates to a very different makeup, work style, and for the guys who are writing the checks, it actually means you can do things cheaper in R, simply because the talent base is broader, more accessible, and younger. Okay? So that's the big advantage of R with respect to community, plus the ecosystem. And the gentleman in the back, I, don't, I can't see your name tag. Jay. Jay. Uh, among the R community, through 15 years of work in this community, are a, uh, a, a repository of packages of pre-built software, ready to rock, documented, free for the download, called CRAN, or the Comprehensive R Archive Network. Question. Does the R is platform independent, so if I have an SAP yeah. environment versus Microsoft, I can write the same R code of both? Largely, I'll, have, I'll get into some of that. There's some, there's some places where that diverges real badly. It creates a lot of problems. And we think that's actually a big trap for users of R. The open source version of R, there's only one company that creates a version of R that is not based on the open source interpreter. And they struggle a lot with compatibility with this. So if you have 6,500 packages, you, get, you probably can't read this, but parallel computing, machine learning, multivariate stats, Phylogenics, I don't even know what phylogenics is. Anybody know what phylogenics is? I think it's the study of species of animals. But in the medical business, um, uh, things like uh, uh, research, reproducing research to share it with, say, the DEA or with the uh, FDA when you're creating drug uh, submission packages. Uh, finance, risk analytics, uh, clinical trials. So very specific to certain verticals, people write software and share them in their communities and they use this common repository. There are 6,500 packages available. There's one package I know of that has 800 algorithms in it. So I don't know what the total algorithm count in CRAN is, but I'll guess it's somewhere between 20,000 and 50,000. So a lot of free done, pre done work for people in R to use. And so this is one of the things that accounts for its growth. So the language itself, yeah, kind of a neat language. Does, you know, does matrix and math for you pretty easily. and handles a lot of the dirty work. It does file I.O. on text files for you. And a lot of simplicity. But you then step out into the world. You have millions of fellow R programmers to use to help you build better software. And thousands upon thousands of pre-built algorithms to help do that. And, and that isn't the only repository. In the biostats world, there is a separate repository altogether called Bioconductor that also provides a rich array of uh, downloadable research, results of research, and algorithms. So it's a very powerful language. You certainly don't want to go write a website in R. It's not for that. And don't use it to uh, balance your checkbook. You can. It'll do it great, but it's not designed for that. It does things like visualization. Many of those packages produce JPEGs, scatter diagrams, bar charts, plots, histograms. Directly from the language, you say, histogram, data set, and boom, up on your screen pops a histogram. And then there are very sophisticated packages for building your own graphics, and I'll get into later how you can use those. But as we begin to apply any language, or R or otherwise, to big data problems, there's some things to keep in mind. If we go back to the goal, that the goal is predictability of behavior, whether it's behavior of a pump or behavior of, uh, what's her name? The progressive gal. Oh. Flow. flow. <laughs> it's, if it's flow, predicting what the next person in the door is going to do. The challenge remains that the more data you use to build models, the better your result is likely to be. And particularly in an area known as machine learning or deep learning, this becomes increasingly important. The history of statistics has been, if you have too much data, take a small sample of the data and build a model that predicts that sample correctly. Then go verify that model works for some more data. You've probably got a pretty good predictor. Okay. Once you've done that, how do you get the next step in accuracy? How do you improve the performance a little more? You take in more data. And this reveals some problems because when we look at R, it has its heritage in a language called S, which is 25 years old. 
What was characteristic of most computers 20 years ago, or even 15 years ago? Memory-based, Memory single-threaded, one core on a chip. We're no longer in that world, thanks to physics. We made a bad choice, guys. We chose silicon. And about 1998, 99, one of my old roommates is a chip designer for Intel. He says, we manages 100 people or says, we, we have all. He says, the wires in your Intel chips are about 10 atoms wide now. And at nine, eight atoms, the wires stop working. And so suddenly, why do you think your laptop has four cores in it? Because they can't put one core in here and make it go fast enough without making it smaller. And as soon as it goes smaller and they turn up the clock, it gets hot. So there are all these physics limitations in chip design. And so now, even your laptop has what? How many cores? Two? Four? Uh, four. Four? Okay. What's a nice server got on it today? 32. 32, so that's number. And now there's a, uh, there's a 36 core available and a 48 is coming. Uh, the, you know, Intel just keeps adding more. Intel has a chip that has 100 cores on it. It's old 486 chip, so it's a great little graphics processor. It kind of sucks for anything else. But we are in a solidly multi-core world. And that's, a, that's another one of these linebackers coming in from the blind spot of the guy who's wearing the helmet and charging forward. That clipped the industry. And we had to figure out how to deal with that. So what I'm going to tell you about is that. But in R, we have limitations. It's memory-based. It doesn't really do parallel computation. It runs a single thread, even on a four-core machine. R runs a single thread, and a lot of languages do, unless they are thread-safe languages. And the more modern languages are thread-safe. The second thing that bites it, how many of you work in a large corporate environment, a bank? Can you deploy open source without a support contract? There you go. OK, spot on. We see this probably half the corporations we deal with are not allowed to deploy any kind of open source technology unless they are buying it from a company that has signed them a support contract. Here's my phone number. Here's your SLA. I'll call you back within one meal time's worth or a day's worth. Okay? So these are the things that dog any, any open source technology and, and a little bit of R. Some other things that people in the predictive analytics world need to watch out for is productivity. Lots of things that can dog your productivity, and I'm going to get into one of them that's the most important, and it's directly related to the core problem. But he had a question. Yeah, question. Um, uh, could you, on, on that slide behind, could you elaborate a little bit more about requiring data movement? Yeah. Yeah. Very good question. So let me give you an example of that'll exemplify what I'm talking about. In a past life, working for a little company that's now called Pivotal, went trotting into a little auto company up in Detroit that had a little bitty credit scoring problem. And the little bitty credit scoring problem as they were running it in SAS was they wanted to put a prediction of credit worthiness on 100 million households, some big number. And uh, they said, well, it's taken us six hours to run that prediction, and we really like to smash that time down a little bit. And so we hopped up and put it up on our big parallel machine, and by golly, six hours ran in 15 minutes. But we had won the war. And they came to us and they said, yeah, you won the war, but you won more than the war. And they said, why? They said, well, because. When we were running that before, it took six hours to run the statistical part of the computation. And we could only do that after we ran the move the data routine. And the move the data routine was taking 48 hours. So as big data grows exponentially, network bandwidth is only growing like this. And so anytime you get into a big data situation that requires the data to be hoisted off of its resting place, you're heading for this mismatch. Maybe okay today, maybe okay tomorrow, but as you grapple with big data and more big data to bring more data sets to bear on the prediction problem, you run a great likelihood of getting into a situation where your system falls over, not because it can't perform the computation, but because you don't have enough money to warm up the data center with that many NIC cards and 10 gig Ethernet connections. Okay? That's one of the reasons Hadoop is so important. Hadoop is designed for one thing, keep the data in one place, analyze the data, in the CPU to which the disk drives are directly attached, no connection through the SAN, no hookups over the network. So we call that data locality. And most of what I'm going to show you are the approaches where you can work up to data locality using R and not have to hoist data up and move it around. Did that answer, that answer your question? Data movement is, 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 we always did that. We downloaded things onto our laptop. Right. So give you an example. Major healthcare concern up in Minneapolis. We ask them, how many data marts do you have? Copies of data, duplicates of data, data coming from a source and being put in other systems. 27,000 was their number. When they counted them, 
all the servers and all the data miners and all the data warehouses and all the operational applications that held data they were used at 27,000. They were one of the earliest to adopt the term data lake. Yeah. So it's exactly the same problem we're facing, but let's forget big data at the moment. In our company, we have the regular data. Um, we have different data sources, different distributed and EDW. But in order to do analytics, we still have data movement going on. So we are moving yeah. all this from you know, different data sources consolidating into, let's not call it EDW, something else. But still, there's some data movement that's still occurring. It's not zero data movement. And we are not on a right. Hadoop-based architecture. When we move into our RDPMS, that needs massive compute, obviously, on which we are running R. And for the data scientists to turn out and provide a predictable value, uh, it is taking us anywhere between four to five weeks. And that's, uh, that, that's a big challenge. If that's in any enterprise, that's how the data movement has to be. Yeah. Right? So for you to move the data, whether you want to do Hadoop or not, you get into a centralized location, one set of team or one set of group of data people you get to use that, right? So that has nothing to do with Hadoop or not, right? Then, whether it's RDBMS or Hadoop, you still have the same problem. That's your stepping stone to get to your analytics. Right, right. So uh, Hadoop is a partial solution to your problem. Yeah. You're correct. You're never going to get away from data movement. The goal is to minimize it. That's and right. particularly so that every time some programmer wants to run a regression algorithm, they don't have to first move a half a terabyte of data. Yeah. Yeah. That's the poison. That's what you want to avoid. If they're moving 10 gigabytes today and data's going up exponentially, how long will it be before they come to the IT team and say, I need a faster connection because I now need to run I mean, I need to move 100 gigabytes, and after that, a terabyte. So this is why you, you want to watch those trajectories and think, where is that going to put me in two years? When the business case says, if I could just get this data, and 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 this data, all in one place, and I'm not exaggerating, 10 unrelated data sets is every day. We have clients that have tables that are 100,000 fields wide. You'd never do that in an RDBMS, and they're mostly sparse data. But if their Boolean event showed up at the website, didn't like his phone call, eats Cheerios for breakfast, has dark hair, wears glasses, these are all Booleans. They, you may know none of that, but you know a little bit of it, and you can run logistical analysis on those types of big, wide fields of Booleans and get all kinds of interesting decision trees for predicting how someone's going to behave. How many Netflix users in the room? They ever kind of freak you out how it knows what you think you want to watch? Well, that's a big classifier algorithm. Giant predictive models feeding into a classifier. So the minute you log in, it says, he watched this and this and this and this, therefore a pretty good bet he's going to like that and that and that and that. And by the way, there's a million dollar prize given out by Netflix every year for the person who makes the biggest improvement in the performance of that predictive algorithm. That's how important it is to their business. So data movement, yeah, it's going to be here forever. But the more data we gather, the more poisonous that data movement is going to be. And that's where Hadoop tends to be used as the place. We call it the data lake. We call it the data puddle. We call it the data landfill. I've heard that term. I've heard puddles, lakes, landfills. What other, what other data, big data terms have I missed? There's a few other words that people use. Data yarn. Data what? Data yarn. Data yarn? Yarn. 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 Data yarn. Okay, that's a new one on me. I'll... Data dump. Data swamp. Uh, that's probably the most the pre the predictive one because there's snakes hiding in the swamp and you, you, can get, you can get caught spending an awful lot of time killing alligators that you should be shoveling. <laughs> All right, well, let's move forward. Some of the other motivators that are changing the way people behave. Productivity is an important thing. Um, one of the challenges that's showing up is that, yeah, you know, these data guys, they're expensive and, and they, they do massive and wonderful things. How can I train my average business users to do in predictive analytics what Excel allowed them to do in basic day-to-day -day small data management. And so there's a split coming in the industry we're in where there is a need for both a heavy-duty tool that's programming-based because most programmers don't want to back out of a programming language to draw pictures. If you're a coder, you want to code. But if you're a business guy and you don't want to learn to code, you want to draw a picture. Well, it's two very different uses and they need to interrelate. And so these productivity problems are showing up everywhere. We're seeing, actually, as I mentioned, most math and stats programs teach and use R. At the University of Colorado, near where I live, the MBA program, not a math program, not a stats program, they teach big data. Why do they teach big data? They're teaching big data because big data is the key 
to analytically based decisions rather than gut feel decisions. And they're trying to produce for industry a class of business leader who understand analytical techniques for use in the business environment. And so these are, this is a sea change. This is occurring in all industries at very rapid pace. So I'm going to skip past this. So here's the question. If Hadoop is as close to a full answer to minimizing data movement and getting big data to where we can wrangle it, because the data's all got to be in one place, right? If it's as close as we can get to a good platform for that today, how can we use R with that platform so we can take advantage of the big community, the language, and a lot of the already done work that exists in Cran and other places, and yet apply that to big data in Hadoop, hopefully without moving data around too much? Well, there's no easy answers. And it depends on what your organization is trying to do. But there, we, I broke it up and I kind of looked at the different approaches. There's about eight or nine different architectures that you could use, and the question is how do you choose. So I'll use those as a vehicle for describing kind of some growth paths for you. Okay, so that's where we're going to go next. And then at some point I'm going to show you what our product does, and it'll smell and feel really commercial. And what I want you to take away is I'm in the business of describing a commercial product every day, all day. It's what I do for a living, love my job, right? Reality is, I'm using it as an example of, we are not the only game in town, we're probably the only one that really does good R, but there are other ways to go about harnessing the do for big data. The problems are the same as they are with our product, and the advantages are the same. So if you have any questions about somebody else's product, you know, we study them all competitively. I got a pretty good, pretty good knowledge of what's going on in companies like H2O and, and some of the competitive stuff. So think of the commercial parts of what I'm going to show you as actually exemplary of a class of products, and then I'll try not to rah rah our product too much, although it's wired pretty deep in my psyche to do that. So the first, the first option for using R with Hadoop is as simple as I'll get out. It's a data movement based solution. Right? So if you've got typical traditional statisticians and your data sizes are not huge, uh, lots of little files in Hadoop, that kind of thing, just hook R directly to Hadoop. There are a series of connectors. There's an RODBC connector. You can hook it to any database you want, including Hive and Hadoop. How many of you know what Hive is? Okay, Hive is a SQL layer that was put into Hadoop. It runs in MapReduce. It's batchy as all hell and slow, but nobody's got anything better yet. Even though they're, you know, Pivotal and Cloud Air are all claiming they've got the next great database for Hadoop. The fact is, most people are using Hive. Looks a little bit like SQL. And for those of you who take a picture of the slides, I'll happily give you the slides. But feel free to, I'm not telling you don't take pictures, but I, I can save you a lot of, a lot of clicking uh, just by giving you the PowerPoint. Or you could use our HDFS. Who knows what HDFS is? Hadoop? Yeah, you're the organizer. You don't count. What's HDFS? <laughs> Hadoop file system. It is a distributed file system that makes three copies of every block of a file. It takes a file, breaks it into blocks, stores all the blocks, and then sends a duplicate of each block to two additional locations, and it maintains a catalog of where the blocks are. If one node falls over, it says, oh, well, I've got copies of those here, 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 and here, and continues on. It's a distributed file system. Um, how about HBase? HBase. Hey, how many mainframe programs have we got in the room? Anybody here ever work? All right, you're going to love it. HBase is basically vSAM for Hadoop. Databases are square. They are not relational. They are big denormalized two-dimensional tape. That's great. If you're doing high-speed data, that's one of the fastest way to deal with it. Well, there's a connector to HBase in a package that we happened to open source a couple years ago called R Hadoop. And so you can go out and download the R Hadoop connector, R Hadoop project with the R HDFS connector, the R HBase connector. You can go to the uh, 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 to the internet and pull down the R Hive. You can use ODBC. And there's lots of ways to connect the data that's in Hadoop. Good things are it's all open source. It's all free. Do it today. You can be up and running in this solution as long as you have access to the Hadoop cluster before I finish my first hour. However, you're still computing in memory. You still have to move the data, but it's R through and through with R packages, the way R packages are made to be used, and you can download it today. So that's the baseline. And we have people doing this all day, every day. The second is to download a somewhat improved version. It'll run a little fast. These are kind of in order, order of performance, by the way, if you can't figure that out. We're going to start with the baseline and go faster. A little bit faster than open source R is an addition of open source R that we make freely available called Revolution R Open. We take the open source interpreter that's available from the producing foundation over in Austria, and we gut it. We take out the open source math libraries. 
you've never seen it in your code, code runs the same, just faster, and we plug in some stuff called the Intel Math Kernel Libraries. Does anybody know what LAPAC is? Or BLAS? These are open source math, or no, open source math primitive libraries, say that three times fast, um, that most products use. And they use them because they're open source free and easily distributed. But Intel knows how to make those functions run faster on Xeon chips. And so the MKL libraries make all those functions run faster. We bind that with Revolution R, with R, and we call it Revolution R open and we put it out freely to the community. You can go download this today. Does everything open source R does, but when you're doing math in R, or when you call a package, an algorithm that's written in R, it's going to run faster because the MKLs are multi-threaded and they use all the cores in certain of the computations. Doesn't change your code at all. Average performance improvement, 2x. Is, is the MKL library only for the Xenon chip, or does it, do they, do they you know, any of it, it doesn't break anything anywhere else. It probably delivers a little less benefit if you run it, say, on an AMD chip. But my understanding is it pretty much accelerates, it rises all boats. I was, I was specifically asking, like, you know, the you know, the i7s, et cetera. Oh, um, the whole, the whole, the whole Intel line. line. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the more recent the chip, the better MKL is going to perform because the chips are better. But it'll do things like use all the registers and all the threads and the hyper-threading capability. It'll do multi-threading instead of single threading. And it's just, it's just a, a more efficient and more highly tuned math. Um, we license it from Intel, and they, of course, it helps them sell their chips. So they say, yeah, yeah, fine, give away. And so we give away. You don't have to do anything special to fix that. No, code is identical. Everything in CRAN continues to run. Now, limitations, it accelerates the math. And if the package you're calling is written in R, it'll accelerate the packages as well. If the, if the package is written in C++, Java, or Fortran, you're tough. It's going to run the same speed. However, data is still in memory, and you still got to move it, because it's coming over here to memory. It works on, now, this reveals, let's call it option 2A, which is the one we see a lot of people do it. Option 2 is to use Revolution R open on your workstation. OK. How much RAM is in your workstation? What do you got? 16 gig? Yes. Okay. 32 gig, you can get that now on a laptop. You can go out and buy a cheapy server, white box, or go down to Austin and pick one up from Dell, and for 10,000 bucks, you can get a quarter to a half a terabyte of RAM in a 16 core server. Gee, what can I do with a half a terabyte of RAM? Well, about 10 times as much data as you can with a laptop. And so, the very same technologies also work on servers, and then you can share those servers. Share them using remote logins on the desktop, share them using a couple of other technologies, and run our applications on the same data in the same place, just move the data into something that's got a hell of a lot more RAM, and now your analysts can chew on 10 times as much file. Of course, they're going to wait 10 times as long, which reveals the direction we're going in performance. That is parallelism. Question? I, I'm going to hate to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it. So if you have a, like a HANA environment from SAP in memory computing, is it, is it advantageous to move the data into a HANA and then, then run R on HANA? It depends. Um, the HANA guys, like any other database, and I'll just, by way of full disclosure, I was at Sybase right up until I got bought by SAP, and at one point I wrote a blog taunting HANA before I knew they were buying us, and they have had something to do with the fact that I no longer work at Sybase. Because <laughs> uh, I taunted the founder of SAP in my blog. He got up in front of Sapphire in Europe, thousands of people, and drew pictures on the board that he clearly essentially abstracted from what we were using in some case, because we had a columnar database and he was hyping columnar. So all of the database vendors, to some degree or other, have embedded analytics in the database. I'm going to show you later what we're doing for Microsoft that will actually probably exceed most of what's out there. But we, if you look at Oracle Exadata, they have a series of functions that live in the database already parallelized. I want to get to the parallel cases before I go too deep. HANA is an example. R lives outside the database and can call things in the database. And then they have versions of R that run inside. So you can call something from the SQL, and it will go outside and do some work and come back. There's several different options. None of them that quite rise to the level of anything other than something that's going to trap you in HANA for life. The big concern is, with every solution, what happens when the geopolitics changes to your code? Do you have to take your code and rewrite it to move it to another platform? Hadoop, for example. How many of you can tell me what the lifespan of Hadoop is? Or the next step in Hadoop? I can't tell you. I'm in the bit. That, that's what I do, right? Hadoop 1 came out five years ago, four years ago. 
It basically got obsoleted very quickly by a new programming model called Yarn MapReduce in Hadoop 2. And there are articles now, appeared three or four months ago, saying Hadoop 2 is now dead. Spark's the future of the world. How long will Spark last? We'll see. It's a bunch of academics from Berkeley. I don't see a lot of depth there in running commercial companies. And sure enough, there's a, there's a successor Apache project that made it even better called Apache Ignite. It's the grid game guys. What's after grid game and Apache Ignite? OK, continuum of change in the platform is a risk. Everything you build today may become shipwrecked if you choose incorrectly. And that's one of the reasons I'm going to go through this so tediously about parallelism and about vendors and portability. Because whatever you do today, how many, of you, how many of you work in companies that throw your work out in two years and redo it? <laughs> One or two, okay. Great job security. You need to stay at that company as a programmer. <laughs> Life is good for you. <laughs> for everybody else, we're still running stuff that was built in the 80s. How many mainframes still exist in the world running COBOL and CICS? Big numbers. Software's like bad guano. We just add. We never really take it out of the cave. And so we have to be careful in analytics because we're going to build things that drive the business. The underlying platforms are going to change, and we don't want to have to undo that work. So this is an example of the effect of the math kernel libraries. In a matrix multiplication, which is a transparent operator in R, just passes it right down to the MKLs. The gray bar is how long it takes in open source R with the open source math libraries. And these two bars give you an idea of what a one core and a four core version of the MKLs will do. So same interpreter, just different name, but it has these higher performing math libraries in it. Now, are you going to get 20x? If you're really creative and lucky and you only do one thing, you might get 20x. You might see an average of 2x, because 90% of your code is moving data around and doing everything to get ready to go compute. But at that moment of compute, some of those things are going to run five times or 10 times faster. We had one customer quote 150x they think they found. I'm not sure I'm moving. So the MKL thing is a pretty powerful tool. Couple that with putting it over on a server where you've got a lot of data. And now you've got, you've got a pretty decent step up in performance. I, I you still have to move the data from the dude. Can, can you go back to that last slide real quick? Yeah. I, I just want to make sure uh, I'm understanding what the slide is actually saying. OK. So on the x-axis, you have a percent, right? Yep. But this is, this is time. Think of this as time. OK, so the total is performance. So just to make sure I understand, for matrix multiply with standard R, if that's your baseline, which is whatever time it is, RRO four core is done in a fraction, about a twentieth, like five percent of the time. Five percent of the total time. Okay. Twenty times faster. And the way the reason it's doing that is it's this is going to run single threaded always. Period. Right. This story. And if I restrict it to running on one core, it still does a lot better because right. it's just more efficient. It's using the registers of the chip better than the open source. It also knows how to do thread safe. And if I turn on the threads and run in four cores, I get even a, a further improvement. Yeah. That's I what it's saying. Sure I, I, I understood the uh, Yeah, I don't I don't like long is better, tall is or long is worse, tall is worse charts. I would invert that chart if I had made this. Is physical or you know most of these days we run everything on virtual has the same effect. Same effect. Yeah. Yeah. All the hypervisors are doing bare direct to bare metal on things like this anyway. On a physical you would probably be depending on your capacity, you have multiple VMs running. So that wouldn't that factor be in this one? Proportion. You know, in the end, saturation is still saturation. This will run as fast as it can run until something saturates. Yeah. If you're on a heavily loaded uh, 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 ESX server, yeah. you're going to see the saturation hit. And it's going to hit you. It's one of the reasons everybody's going to Hadoop, because yeah. you need multiple backlines, multiple address spaces, multiple connections to this, multiple network connections in order to get aggregate performance. And it's this exactly the same yeah. problem. Yeah, but up on ESX. That's one of the reasons. You can. We run in the cloud. We do all our development in the cloud. Works great. However, you know, it goes here. On bare metal, it goes here. So, you know. Anyway, so moving along a little bit. So the problem of Hadoop is real simple. Hadoop is designed to give you the ability to gang together lots of storage, storage bandwidth, network bandwidth, compute horsepower, and then pass parcel work out that scatters across. Is, it, is anybody here a Hadoop programmer? Anybody ever write a mapper reducer in Java? One guy. Okay. Fun, fun coding. You like doing that? Uh, that's how I learn. Yeah, that's how everybody learns. And uh, this is the net effect of the 
wires getting 10 atoms wide the chip. We now have to do multi-core, multi-socket, multi-everything in order to get performance. The problem is how you do that. If I'm just adding numbers together, who cares? The problem is most of predictive analytics is based upon fairly complex algorithms that were designed in the day when there wasn't massive parallelism. How do you conduct a linear regression in steps so that you can scatter the work across many nodes? That is not a trivial easy problem. So, mathematicians in the room, if I have 10 people, if I have 10 people that need to compute the average of a bunch of numbers, and I give you some numbers and you some numbers and you some numbers, that's a very simple calculation to, to parallelize. If I ask you guys, without talking to each other, to find the median value, how do you do that? You've got 300,000 numbers in your stack, and you've got 274,000 numbers of unknown distribution, randomly piled in, and you've got the same. How do you find median? So that gives you an example of the thinking that has to go on to get this parallelism to work. We have to take the math and divide the math up into individual tasks, pull results back to some kind of an entity that may do multiple tasks on each chunk of data. This is what Java MapReduce programs, as this gentleman knows, this is how you build Facebook. You write many, 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 many steps and you apply each step in sequence to many, 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 many chunks of data. Okay, so to tell you what we do, Let's cut right to the chase. There are two packages and methods, three, that will allow you to actually do parallelized work in Hadoop from R. The first ones are things like do parallel, do MPI, and RX exec. This is in one of our products. These are things we support in the open source, and there are others like them. Iterators and for each looping, where you say to Hadoop, go do some work on the data. Here's the work I want you to do. And Hadoop will take care of running that work in parallel. So this is the first time we're actually holding the data in Hadoop and we're doing the work in Hadoop at the behest of the user without pulling the data over here. Problem is, we're doing this manually. We're back in this environment, the old environment I showed you where you have to actually do the parallelization. So let's take an example of the complexity. This is the k-means clustering algorithm. Anybody know what k-means is? Let's say I have 10 or 20 variables that describe household income, behavior, location, geography, uh, spending habits, number of kids. And I want to kind of create groups that are cohorts that behave alike. When I have lots of variables, I have three variables that's easy to do by hand and just kind of sort and figure out who's behaving the same. K-means does it mathematically and it creates what are called centroids. You kind of tell it roughly how many different distinct groups you want and it'll tell you what the center of each of those populations is in the multi-dimensional space that describes age and height and weight and buying habits and you know lovable moods. Right? Well K means very exacting algorithm to do it distributed when you're not in a single address space. The best we know how to do is six steps. Each block of data has to be brought in, the step performed on all the blocks, bring it all back to the master. The master says, mm, okay, based on all of those results, here's step two. It goes back and forth. And all of the algorithms that major statistics that are really doing any kind of machine learning do that. They have complex paths to go from a single CPU to many CPUs on many sets of data. And so what you wind up looking at is something like this. I have my six steps, two, four, six, eight, ten, and twelve. But in order to make them work, I have to have one that kicks off some work, sorts the information from step one, does step two, sorts step two, does step three, and so on. How many pieces of code did I write to do a six-step process? It's on there. 13 pieces of code. And then I have to make them all work together, test them, validate them, check all the corner cases. And so this is where the problem creeps in of Hadoop. We know that with enough time, energy, code, tests, and work, we can parallelize just about anything. What we also know is all that time spent there, if there's a better way, we ought to look for it. Okay? Our commercial product does this in Implicitly inside of itself for a certain set of algorithms. There are other products and capabilities out there. Spark, for example, has a library of <coughs> machine learning algorithms that are redesigned like this. These are refactored, parallelized algorithms. And so that's what we do. This, and I'm going to tell you what we do, and then I'm going to show you the next four options for Hadoop that use this parallelized technology. Uh, and again, there are equivalents of this in the market. Uh, but Revolution R Enterprise is a high performance, scalable addition to R that is portable across a bunch of platforms. Remember I said you don't want to be caught writing once and have a rewrite in two years. 
and it makes it a lot easier to build because you don't have to build those 13 steps yourself just to do one algorithm. So, yeah? Do you break? You want to take a lunch break now? Okay. Let me finish this. This is kind of, I'm hitting a breaking point right about now. Um, the scaling capabilities with our, through our product and similar suits from others, come from the fact that a single workstation or server can make a call that says, go do algorithm XYZ on data set ABC and step away and just wait for the answer to come back. This version of the algorithm knows how to sh scatter work across the nodes, perhaps doing either multiple steps or iterating a couple of times to kind of tune the answer to a, an error point that we think is an acceptable result. Maybe wouldn't be unusual to see a, a linear regression run in four or five iterations. And then the answer goes back as though the guy made the call to the algorithm on one machine. And so we turn Hadoop into not a giant server for storage, but into a compute engine for making one call to an algorithm and getting a result from a whole bunch of operations on a whole bunch of nodes. Okay? One client's experience, 227 million observations in about five minutes. Um, that's bringing in and filtering data. Linear regressions on a, a quarter of a billion, less than a minute. On a, this is six node cluster, it's a tiny little cluster, 10 nodes, 10 task nodes. Multiple linear regression, about a minute. We start doing these very complicated machine learning algorithms that pick out the most predictive variables and throw out all the rest. One of the fam most famous is called a random forest. It builds a whole bunch of decision trees and horse races them against each other and picks the best after the end, at the end of the horse race. That algorithm running on a quarter of a billion observations, 10 trees deep with 10 different variables, winds up running in about two hours. That's pretty good numbers. There are some people that do faster and slower, but this is kind of the, these are the kinds of volumes of data that you should be expecting to think about. Millions to billions of events. Twitter's test case that they gave us was half a trillion, I think. And so we actually are able in these algorithms with 10 nodes to actually beat our way through quite a large number of data sets in a reasonable amount of time. Someone can say, oh, a minute, oh, go give me a cup of coffee. Slurp, 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 come back, hey, here's my answer. Historically, that was a day. Just go fast is only part of the problem. We got into some of this at lunch, and, and some of the questions are, how do you then deal with these things in a production context? 35. Production context brings in a whole bunch of new players and a whole bunch of rigor to make sure it's supportable, it stands up, and it stays up. How many of you fight with the guys who deploy your applications because they say, you haven't tested it enough? Well, we have the same problem in analytics. One of the things that we're finding, and I, we, we got into this over lunch, is how do you deal with that situation? This is one of the places where portability from platform to platform is really useful. Because if Hadoop is Hadoop, it's big, it's complex, it's very powerful, but occasionally, okay, uh, occasionally it can be a little unwieldy. And not very many organizations trust Hadoop as a pure four, four and a half, nines level of reliability production platform. Well, what if, because the product is portable, I can stand up a big data lake, data swamp, data landfill, do all my modeling, bring my data in, manipulate my data, convert my data into the kinds of data I need to run analytics, explore that data visually and look and see how the data lays out, explore that data with statistical tests, model that data to produce predictors of um, whether or not you're going to knock over a liquor store tomorrow. Uh, you know, uh, and then take that prediction equation. How big is that equation going to be? 100 bytes? Maybe 1,000 bytes on a really good day. And move that over into a production platform. This is the very likely outcome of most statistical modeling, is that we'll continue modeling these massive data platforms like Hadoop and its successors. But a lot of the actual execution of those models will be moved over into platforms that are very trusted by the core IT organizations that lose their jobs if stuff goes down and stays down. To wit, one of our clients that we've been dabbling with wants to build the ability to perform about 30 predictive calculations on each of their customers every morning. I'm not going to tell you who they are. They're in California. They have a very short name, a very colorful little logo made of letters. You buy and sell things there. But I'm not going to tell you who that is. No, I know. It couldn't have been either. They were able, what they want to do is run 30 models across every participant 
every morning in a few hours. They couldn't do that in their current context. What they figured out they could do, though, was to take all the data out into a big data lake where they can grind on it and build these models. And every night, they can refresh the model. They run all day long refreshing the model. And they get a little tweak here, a little more about the person's age in the equation, a little less about what they ate yesterday. A little adjustments, what we call retraining of models. <coughs> Repost that model into the trigger in the database, because they've now moved the model from Hadoop over inside a database. And then every morning, they just run an update on that column and re-trigger, rerun that calculation every column. Well, that's an easy calculation. And we just shortened the time from retraining the model to running it against the customers to about 10 seconds. You finish retraining the model in Hadoop and you send this tiny little file over the database, install the database, and say, rescore the customers. So part of the question about big data requires you to stop and think we are not talking about developing software. We're talking about developing an artifact a predictor, an equation that then goes over and lives in another application. And so by doing that, we can also separate these kind of questionable big data platforms that are maybe not thoroughly trusted for production applications and actually do the scoring of the data, actual computing of your credit worthiness score, whether I'm going to give you a credit card tomorrow. I can do that computation in a production platform. Okay, so bear that in mind as you're thinking about big data, that some of what you need to do is think about we're no longer building code and running it. We're building models and running them in code. And that's a completely different equation with the ability to split things. This is the internals of our product. Uh, Revolution Enterprise is a one-piece product that may come with two distributions because some of it runs on Windows if you want to use a Windows IDE and some of them might run on Linux. But it's fundamentally all one price, one product. And our interpreter, it's the open source R with the MKL enhancements for speed of math. And that allows it to run anything you ran anywhere else R was used. If you're using HANA, you can plug Revolution R in place of open source R. In fact, our installer first installs open source R and then wraps around it all these higher performing features. But that core R is there and accessible, so all of the work that SAP does to invoke R from inside the database, that works the same. So we are completely compatible, violently adherent to Open source R, we do not change that no matter what. So we slap in, snap in anywhere open source R is used. But then the enhancements that we lay in around come in three categories. There's a group of things for scale and data access. There's a tool for building and a tool for integrating with other things. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna net these out. We're not gonna dive into them. There are great descriptions available if you wanna dive in. Fundamentally, scale R is the library of algorithms. It's about 80 functions. Linear regression, logistic regression, machine learning, statistical tests, decision trees, blah, 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 blah. It's been rewritten in a parallel form that's portable so that it can be deployed on Hadoop, can be deployed in Teradata, Linux, Windows, Windows HPC clusters, and I'll show you in the roadmap section in a few minutes, very soon, Azure Cloud and SQL Server. And by being portable, we do it one time. All the algorithms, all 80 of the functions run all the places all the time. They use ConnectR, which is a library of data connectors. How many of you have text files? And how many of you have SAS files? SPSS files? We have connectors for all of those. We're building additional connectors for various Hadoop data formats, like we have an Avro connector now. It's kind of experimental. And we're looking at building an API where we can plug in connectors to other kinds of data in Hadoop, because one of the things about Hadoop is we're not the only guy in the back, in the back engine. There's a, there's a database back there that may be producing data. There's people writing Java MapReduces, Rajesh does, uh, that may be producing additional data. What we need to do is comply with the industry standard formats that are used in Hadoop. We will build connectors to adjust those. And those will be part of this connect our library. Distributed R is an abstraction layer. I've long said, what do we sell in the software business? Do we sell software? Nope, we sell abstraction. We sell abstraction. I make this look like a desktop so you don't have to write code to add numbers. Okay, that's an abstraction. The other abstractions that we do here are we have a layer that produces the services that these algorithms need, gets the data to them, tells them what to do, and brings the answers back. And I have four versions of this. And for every platform we sell, there's one version of distributed R that makes it look the same to the algorithms. So the algorithms are portable. The develop R is an IDE. I'll show you just very briefly what develop R looks like. You're going to say, oh, it looks like Visual Studio. 
you know, like the gal against the guy they had for not even drinking V8. Yeah, I could have had an IDE. Uh, it's the Visual Studio through and through. And then Deploy R is a web services gateway. What if you had a predictor in R and you wanted to make a prediction available to some application that you wrote on the website? <coughs> you certainly don't want to have to put R everywhere. How about you just set up an R server or a Hadoop cluster that acts as an R server and you expose a series of web services APIs that are predict customer behavior, predict customer churn. That's what this gateway does. So you can take an R script that has an input and an output and wrap a web service and expose that out on your services oriented architecture. Question? Yes, it's RESTful. And exchanges XML and JSON documents. Yeah, so you can expose a RESTful API and thus keep the R footprint, if you will, constrained to those servers where you want to run R. But that's basically what's in the product. You've seen some of this performance data. Most important is this. Um, the, it, the behavior is linear. Look at the numbers. These are the number of events that I'm running the regression on right up to uh, hundreds of millions, and you'll notice the line goes straight up. And the reason that's important is that shows that we're not hitting any limits of scalability. As we add data, it just takes a little longer to compute. As we add nodes, the line comes down linearly. Okay? And this is what you want in any kind of big data product. Um, in the interest of time, I want to show you this real quickly. So if you are curious what we support in these algorithms that run really, really, really fast, this is the list. Bunch of stuff for getting data in, merging it, sorting it, splitting it, uh, factorizing variables. If I have a number that runs from 0 to 100, I might really want to feed my algorithm yes or no, the number is 0 to 10. Yes or no, the number is 20 to 50. Yes or no, the number is 50 to 90. And yes or no, the number is 90 to 100. Because some of the algorithms want to see Boolean inputs. So this is factorization. We do that in massive parallelism so we can handle lots of data coming in. Descriptive statistics, maybe I want to look and see uh, across a matrix what the sum of squares uh, tells me about error or something in, in, in work I've done there. Or I want to do cross-tabulation of data. Uh, I want to test using some typical statistical tests. All of this is data manipulation and understanding. And then I get into the predictive models, which are really the kind of work, the real heavy-duty work doers like how do I do a multiple linear regression or a covariance matrix? These are matrix inversion kinds of calculations that are very difficult to parallelize. And we've done all that work so that you just call the algorithm, the system moves it to Hadoop, breaks up the work, pulls back the answer, and hands it to you on a silver platter. Again, this is our product. I could point you to three other products where you can go see a similar lecture, a similar talk. So we are not the only game in town, but this nature of getting the parallelism Hidden from view for the statisticians is a crucial piece of producing uh, an agile behavior among your data scientists and allowing them to be productive. In some of the more sophisticated stuff, you get into situations, if you have 1,000 variables or 10,000 variables, and we have customers that have 10,000, 200,000, which ones matter? The neatest thing that statisticians want to figure out is, what do I not need to worry about? If I have 20 variables that all predict the outcome, I can throw out 19 of them and keep one and probably have net the same effect and compute it expediently. And so we use algorithms like stepwise regression to throw out variables that aren't really affecting the output or that are uh, removable because I've got another variable that has the same effect. So this is called feature reduction. We want to get from 10,000 columns down to maybe 50 columns or 10 that predict the behavior because that's a reasonable number that I can compute periodically on my customers, my stocks, my pumps, my chip wafers, my cars, etc. All right? And then finally, when you start doing things like how quickly after he logs into Netflix can I tell what he's going to want to watch next, I'll probably use a classification algorithm. We just added one called Naive Bayes. The simple logic way I state Naive Bayes is, and this is actually from a real example, if a train nearly runs over a car at a railroad crossing enough times, there's a high statistical probability that one of these days it's actually going to run over the car. And so uh, Bayesian logic and statistics says that if you monitor the near misses, cars at crossings, airplanes at runways, if you monitor the occurrence of near misses, you can predict that something's going to happen before it actually happens and take corrective actions. And Bayesian statistics allows you to do that. We have a naive Bayes predictor or classifier where you can feed data to it, build a model that predicts whether something's likely to happen, and then feed events in in a stream later and say, yes, it's likely, no, it's not. 
in very high rates of speed. So this is the kind of things we're building as predictors and classifiers. So could that be used for uh, intrusion detection? It can be, yeah. A lot of, there's a lot of other algorithms that can be used for intrusion detection. In fact, in the network intrusion detection space, uh, it was mentioned Splunk earlier. Splunk Hunk is an extension of what Splunk originally built, which is if I see this kind of pattern building up, uh, you know, dancing around, hitting different ports, I can guess someone's trying to intrude, and I can predict that they're trying to get in. They might get in and start taking action to shut down paths of attack. So yeah, that's, that's one of the places you could use that. There are other algorithms for doing that. They're even more sophisticated, and there's a lot of vertical products that do that for you without you having to go do the stats, too. Okay. It's called, there's an entire market space that's called CM, uh, Security Intrusion Event Detection. So um, in addition to making things run faster, uh, the other things that we do with the product, we provide the ability to stand it up, get it up, make it run, train your staff, provide support for your first deployment. And so we have a fairly rich array of training courses, a rich array of support products, like you pick the problem you want to do the first time, and we'll tell you, you know, we'll put this kind of talent on your site for this period of time to get you going. Because we find people that they don't take training and they don't take some services at the beginning, there's a lot of a lot of elements to this process of adopting big data and predictive analytics. And so, boy, that's a really helpful slide. Let me, uh, I'm going to click this button. Is that better? Okay, <laughs> good. All right, so a lot of things we do, we provide validation of the R tools, we support you, we provide you training, there are services accounts, service uh, uh, packages available, and then we have lots and lots of additional stuff for getting this, uh, this uh, capability deployed. Uh, we have a very rich course catalog. We have ability to integrate with apps. I mentioned this. This is the RESTful gateway um, that gives us the ability. We have direct snap-ins to Excel, Tableau, ClickView. We're developing additional snap-ins that work in behind them, part of Microsoft, of course. Uh, Power BI. We're looking at DataZen, which was just purchased by Microsoft, and several others. And so these are the kinds of consumption frameworks that will allow users to utilize directly in their day-to-day -day job, a prediction it may show up as a graph. It may show up as a thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, this customer is going to churn. This customer is not going to churn. But this is the way we get analytics deployed directly out to users to take action, or to automated systems to take action without a human. This is the last B piece I've mentioned before. We call it right once deploy anywhere. As I mentioned, we're in the abstraction business. We build a layer so we can put these algorithms on all platforms. And when we build a model, we can score that on any platform. So I can build a model in Hadoop that says brown haired 58 year old guys who wear orange shirts are likely to XYZ and from that model I can take that over and run that in the production system by building it in Hadoop and deploying it in a Windows cluster. Okay, So that portability has another effect which I think is the most important of all. I've mentioned it. What's Hadoop look like in 2016 or 2017 or 2018? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. What's the best platform to score your data in? In 2017, it will be SQL Server, because we'll be launching it then in 2016. So it's going to be SQL Server. But there are others. Um, but the ability to know that from a company that has a long history in supporting UNR, with the backing of Microsoft, you've got a pretty good chance that your major platforms will be supported in three or four years, has a very strong risk-reducing effect on your IT activities. And so we continue to pursue not only portability today with right once deploy anywhere, but planning to be on the platforms you're going to use in one, two, or three years without breaking your code. And that's a pretty important capability. Any questions about what we do and how we got here? Okay, there's one of two things we can do, I think, in the remaining time. I can demo the product for you a little bit, and we'll certainly take questions. Or we can talk about the roadmap and what we're working on. We probably can't do both. And I have a show of hands. How many of you are more interested in a quick demo? And how many of you would rather see the roadmap? Let's do the demo first. No voting twice. Roadmap. Demo it is. Okay, I'm not a great demo. We're going to do our best. But before we do that, why don't we take questions? There were a couple. The developer, is it, uh, how is it compared to our studio? Um, very similar functionality. They're both uh, multi-window IDEs. We actually resell our studio in addition to ours. Our studio is another development tool. I'm going to show you our IDE. Our studio looks pretty similar. It has some really neat features if you're in the cloud. And it runs on Linux. So you can bet that they don't compete very much. You're either a Windows desktop company or you're a Linux desktop company, and you're probably not both. And so we do sell our studio. Microsoft actually has a similar relationship with our studio, and our studio remain in line. Does that answer your question? We probably have a little bit better debugging, we think, than they do. They have much better facilities for living in Linux and 
living inside the Hadoop clusters, as a matter of fact. Good. Can you? Sorry. So I wanted to ask you about, I, never, I heard you say about the API integration is through the specific product we have to purchase from you yeah. and expose it. How do I do it on my own without buying? There, is a, there are several gateway products available in the open source. One of them is called RServe. It's a lower level. We actually use it underneath our product, and we embellish it with security and things to make it better. But there are a couple of open source gateway products, starting with RServe, that is, you can just look it up in, in, uh, in uh, I think it's on GitHub. So really if I have a model, then I just have this expose the model to the gateway. And then and yeah, you'd probably send the data to the model and score it and send the data back. But if you're only sending a row of data about one customer, that's a very lightweight activity, yeah. There's a couple of different ways to do it. It's basically you simply invoke R, and you tell the engine which R script to run. And if that script scores your data and gives you back the score, that's what you get back. If it kicks off the model from hell that scores the world, then that's what happens. But it's just basically an invocation method. Our service fairly low level runs on UDP. Not, it's a little tedious because you're dealing with network intrinsics um, when you're using our serve, but there, our serve is out there, it is open source, and it is freely available. And this particular web services that I would call, it just fits out a particular data output, right? So, but if I use something like an OS Studio, it gives me the, the plot maps or whatever. Yeah. Right? So well, you can, um, you can use the, the web service gateway to get back graphics. Oh, really? What it'll give you back is a URL to the JPEG. And I, there may, may even be ways to pass the JPEG in line, but you can get JPEGs and PNGs, I think, depending on what package you're running in R. Yeah, you can return numbers, you can invoke action and get back a status, you can say, go build me a histogram and get back a histogram, for example. Uh, our serve is not web services based, it's actually you have to write UDP packets to talk to it, I understand. I haven't done it, but it's fairly low level. How, how do you deal with data security, like for example, uh, the column that is uh, sensitive or... This is one of the reasons for thinking about putting the analytics down deep inside the engine. If I have the analytics running deep down inside the SQL engine, then the SQL engine can manage column-based encryption for me. And when I need to act on something, if I'm doing booleans, who cares whether I unencrypt it? It's going to look different. Encrypt an encrypted no looks different than an encrypted yes, just like a no looks different than a yes. There's, there's things I can do that I don't have to un unencrypt. But typically, um, the way we build these into the database allows the database engine to handle the key management necessary to manage encrypted columns. I can't give you all the details because we don't have it done yet for SQL Server. I tell you, Teradata is not a very big problem. It's pretty much handled by the database. So Hadoop does not deal with, with data security? You can. Um, the problems in, okay, so, so the, the problem with Hadoop is inside of Hadoop, there's not a lot of protection at a granular level. And so Hadoop admins do the ring fence problem. You ring fence your Hadoop cluster with a network switch that does not allow any traffic to come inside that is other than the very few allowed methods. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that RStudio Pro is so useful, one of the things RStudio Pro does allows you to use thin client access to get inside, it's a web page. Everybody knows how to secure a web page. And your IT team will say, okay, I get it. You're setting up a web server inside on the Hadoop Edge node, and you're only gonna let it talk to RStudio, which only does certain things pretty safe. So would Hadoop be considered a data layer in, in the three? Hadoop, would that be considered a data layer in a three, three layer architecture? Yeah, okay. Hadoop is pretty much a data layer, except you can do a lot of computation there as well. So it, it winds up being an application layer. Okay. It's, a, it's essentially a convergence of the app and the data layer. Okay. More questions? Yeah, you've been patient. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could advice to someone like myself who uh, wants to basically transition careers. Um, currently, I'm, I did chemistry, and I did computational research, but I've discovered that I'm more so interested in um, the computational Cool. And so I'm not... Really You're actually in the right profile because R was designed for scientists, not designed for computer science geeks. It's a scientist's language. Uh, I'll show you a slide, and I'll make that available however we want to do that. And one of the slides I have is, has some course listings that you can go do for free online. There's a one-day course on R. uses our product as its teaching vehicle. Um, there are some you know, three-hour college course level courses, uh, Stanford, Hopkins, uh, all available via a site called Coursera and for free. And very good courses. I learned a lot by taking them as much as I could. I'm not really a statistician. Yeah, lots of, lots of good training out there. I'll give you the ones that we tend to recommend. There's hundreds more. So, okay, so let me do a quick demo, and then we'll be 
not too late. Right, quarter after is what we're shooting for. We're shooting for quarter after, okay, very good. Um, I haven't run this in a bit, so hopefully the crash will be subtle. I actually had a friend who chopped a chicken in half, rubber chicken with a meat cleaver one time at an Apple event because he knew the product was going to crash and he said, if it crashes, we'll sacrifice this here rubber chicken and he laid it down. Nobody knew he had a microphone under the chopping block. And uh, let's just say he woke the room up. So this is our IDE. And the script that I have here is actually computing the... Um, ah, well, that would that'd be a problem now, wouldn't it? So the way we fix that is we go to our... I'm a Mac guy, so I'm having to learn this again. Um, some things I really like about Windows, some things I really love about this, uh, some things I don't, and one of them is that I have to learn everything I knew, because I'm an old guy and I'm not supposed to learn not to do stuff too fast, right? So, I get to qualify as, uh, I resemble the old dog who doesn't, who doesn't really want to learn any new tricks. So let me duplicate my displays, and that should do the job. Dun, 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 dun. Wow. There you go. Wow. There. There we go. Hey, yeah, yeah, we win. Okay, keep changes. All right, so very good. So this is our IDE. It's called Develop R. It's built in an older version of Visual Studio. We will be updating this as one of the projects under Microsoft. What I have is a script that is uh, uh, consuming a fairly large data set uh, of data concerning flight delays. It's a very common data science case. People use this data set all the time to do stuff. And so what you see here is typical coding to pull in data, identify a file called data deer or a location called data deer, and then identify a file. In this case, it's in a format called XDF, which is a format we use internally um, to accelerate the rate at which data comes into the engine. Remember, we have to read data sometimes three and four times. And so you want it stored in absolutely the most efficient format if it's big. And so we have this custom format we use. Some other possibilities uh, are on the horizon for things that are more commonly known. But so one of the things I can do is I can look at my code, right? Here's all the different tests I'm going to do. I can uh, explore what's in here. And this is basically a project view. And my airline data set has a single project. And there's the script, scale our demo, which is a demonstration of our scale library. Now remember, in R, my goal as a programmer is to be as lazy as I can possibly be. R guys sit around and argue. Can you do something meaningful in three lines of code? I can do it in two. Because they're using these packages that have been developed by others. And so, if you're doing a lot of work in a package, you probably want to be able to browse what packages have I loaded, what do they require me to supply, et cetera, et cetera. And so here, I have things like a list of the packages that I have installed. I, the base is a set of about 300 that everybody uses, and then there are others. This is an iteration uh, uh, package that allows me to iterate through lots of data. Uh, Lattice is a set of functions, uh, uh, graphics, Trellis graphics, for example. Here are the ones, Rebo Scale R appears as a package. This has 80 functions in it. So this is a way to explore what's been loaded. And I load things with a single command. I say load, load this package, and it becomes part of my workspace. Over here is my output window. And this essentially is standard out, OK? And, and I see text. So the first thing I would do maybe, I can run this whole script, and it's not meant to do that. Or I can actually run just a couple of lines at a time in this IDE. And so I just click here, which will run just the highlighted lines. And it says, OK, I did your work. And then maybe what I want to do is I want to do, uh, I want to get some statistics about the data set. Rx get info introspects a data set, tells me what's in the data set, and gives me back some stats, some standard deviations, that kind of thing, typically. And so let's run that. There we go. So we just went through a few hundred, a few hundred thousand events, 230 to be exact, shown right here. And it's telling me um, a little bit about the profile of that data and when delays are occurring. And most of the delays are occurring on Saturday, funny thing. Thank God I travel most of the time during the week. Um, and so let's see, another thing I can do here, and this is, uh, the question was asked earlier, can I return graphics? Yeah, let's do that. So let's run a histogram. And this is going to run a while. This is actually a fairly complicated thing. It's going to go through all 200 and some odd thousand events and bucket them all. And it's going to take about 10 seconds to give me this histogram. Okay. 
So it just what really happened here is a, a return was made that was a pointer to, a, to this is probably a PNG or a JPEG, and I'm just bringing that up on screen. The IDE does that automatically. You could also do that in Tableau or in the very near future in Power BI or one of, the, one of the other packages that you're more familiar with on the Microsoft side. Okay, so it is a language. It's a scripting language. It's intended to be executed incrementally, line at a time if you want to, or the whole script, which makes debugging easier. Uh, and while I don't use this IDE regularly, you can, for example, um, introspect a variable. And I forget how to do this. Another window I have to pop up here, but I can pop up a single variable, run a script, and see if the variable changed. So I can, I can introspect the condition of various data frames. If you're familiar with R, a data frame is a, an in memory two dimensional data representation that almost all data in R gets put into a data structure uh, called data frame. So all that stuff's accessible. That is what R is. Now, is that what you want your business guys to use? Nah, you probably want them hitting this by coming in through a website that's got some kind of a web services call to a script like this. So this is one that R is one piece in the end. And one of the reasons Microsoft has bought us is that R is one piece and a stack of technologies that you can use to build very complete, very sophisticated algorithms that are very highly optimized to a particular business case, but do it using these standard pieces that snap together. Okay. Six more minutes. What's the best thing we can do with six minutes? I can't do a whole lot more demos here. I don't have the big data sets. Yeah, we'll do this roadmap. Exactly. Let's do this roadmap. So let me uh, let me jump back out to the PowerPoint here, and I'll show you a couple of things that we're working on. Um, this is my master slide landfill. I like that word landfill. Uh, we'll show you that. It's my carrot in pitch. I thought you might want to see that. Um, but you didn't ask, so you know, you don't ask, you don't see. Uh, switch windows. Well, I closed my PowerPoint that we wanted to see, so let me open that back up. Now, when we talk about the roadmap, uh, it's probably important to realize there's really two aspects of a roadmap for any company. And one is to understand what we're technically going to do, and the other is to understand what's doing it, what's causing us to do what we're going to do. So I'll give you a little bit of both of those. If I can get the screen up a lot here. Hello, Mr. Ben Q. Okay, here we go. We just produced a release called 7.3 that gave us a bunch of things like a gradient boosting <coughs> algorithm and performance enhancements. Uh, we continue to update on Hadoop. So we'll do these releases about one, mm, one a quarter or maybe three a year. Um, we just put out a version 7.4, which added additional things like Bayesian classifiers, um, better ways to deploy in Cloudera, uh, and support for uh, the most common free edition of Hadoop out there. And that's the kind of thing that our small uh, releases do. As we became part of Microsoft, it became very clear that we needed to jump on some things and figure it out. How can you use a product with SQL Server? One way to do it is hook it up via SQL. Not, not the best option, not particularly fast. The other way is to actually export data out using BCP. How many of you are SQL Server users? A couple of you. Okay, you know what BCP is? Okay, it's a command line, dump data in now. So today, we work via either SQL or BCP. We validated this with SQL Server, so you can use it today. And I'll show you in a minute what we're gonna do in the future. Second big area. There is a capability we'll be validating called Polybase. If I was doing something really sophisticated in the database, but I had massive data I wanted to make available for analytics, I could mount a table that's actually underlied by Hadoop. It's called a federation, where you create a table in a Hadoop environment, load data into that table, and now it's stored in Hadoop HDFS. Guess what? I can get at that directly with Revolutionary Enterprise. So we'll be validating the use of Polybase to uh, mount up tables, create tables, and populate those tables as a way to get data out of SQL Server at very high speed uh, as well. As we move on, there are BI tools. Our web services-based integration needs to be validated against Power BI and Data Zen. Data Zen is the new uh, mobile-oriented BI framework that uh, Microsoft bought. I'm not expert in it yet. I have to become that way. And we'll continue to uh, do work to work with Azure, particularly with HD Insights, but also with other Hadoop distros. Today, and some other integrations, we use Visual Studio. 
Um, we have these connections to SQL Server. We have snap-ins to Excel today. Windows is a certified platform, as is Windows clusters. We're working on these other certifications, as I mentioned. The biggest thing that we're going to do is coming up here. What could we do next? What would matter the most? Well, the one that matters the most is this. What if we put the revolutionary enterprise product down inside the SQL Server database like we had already done with the Teradata EW? This is probably the most important addition to the product family that's going to come as part of being um, part of Microsoft. A huge number of SQL Server users out there. Now, is SQL Server a big data platform? We can sit and argue about that. Is it a great production platform where you can push models to score them and run them? Absolutely. It is a great place that your R users may want to do some of their work, but not all. Having compatibility across Hadoop, SQL Server, absolutely. And so uh, SQL Server is planned to contain the core of revolutionary enterprise, the scale our algorithm library, in the v, what they call v.next. And v.next is slated for next year. We'll integrate with uh, the HD inside. Anybody here using Hadoop today? Anybody using? This is a Hortonworks derived Hadoop that is a Microsoft product, and we will integrate with HD Insights over, we're doing the work now, actually. And that will give us the ability to run in Azure and perhaps on-prem, although the plans there are a little bit less uh, direct. Last thing is we will integrate with things like the Azure Data Factory, the Azure Machine Learning Studio. We will normalize the ScaleR library with Microsoft's machine learning library and bring the product lines together. So that's kind of the, the nickel summary of the roadmap. Um, if there, were there a particular roadmap questions you had? Particular things you'd like to see connected up? Way to back. Are you going to have uh, are you going to have a play with SSIS? Don't know yet. Probably um, because we're going to be inside of V.next. It seems like a better fit than your Yeah, I mean, we we would need to be compatible with all the other subsystems that are part of the entire package that is SQL Server, and that would include SSIS. Uh, I don't know exactly the nature of that integration yet, but that's something the engineering team is going to be telling us more about as they do it. So we're, we're not going to be an add-on to SQL Server. We'll be in the box for Enterprise. How, how yeah. does this play into the Power BI, which Microsoft is now kind of pushing towards? That's underway. I don't know the answer to your question. We're just a few weeks in Microsoft, but that's an obvious, direct, um, very high probability integration for us. Um, probably first would be uh, the stuff I showed, maybe the histogram. Being able to go out, do some R work, and bring back answers, bring back pictures, and populate those into panels in Power BI. Then the next question is: Do we be able? Do we have the ability to have R grab data right out of the queue and do work on that? So there's actually a couple of steps in that that we haven't mapped out entirely. So they're kind of cross two teams and don't work together too much. So we're waiting to see how that shakes out. But that's definitely a targeted, a targeted integration for us. More questions? Well, I know you mentioned about H2O. Yeah. It's so H2O, a very good machine library. Yes. So it brings everything into memory, right? So how do you do first on that? I mean, they are also R based. They do a lot of R API. H2O makes a very good product. They're a very small company that got run out of money about a year ago, and you know, so we, we know how they feel. But uh, we don't know where H2O goes. Fundamentally, H2O provides a building tool, an execution tool, and a connector into things like Spark. We do all those same things. Yeah, yeah. And then you can rely on Spark to do some things that are not in memory, but the performance takes about a 20x. As you, as you go out the curve and you run out of memory in any system, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's Newtonian physics. You're going to hit the disk. When you hit the disk, down you go. Uh, we're the same way. So we will have uh, our Spark set as experimental right now. It's actually in the product you can't. You can't see it in the docs, but if you know the right magic magic words to say, uh, it'll allow you to fire up and run Spark, and we'll have a Spark uh, version of the product fairly quickly. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, the reason that's important is running in memory. I mean, 20x boost. Doesn't everybody want a 20x performance in Kuzla? That's like being better looking and richer in one step. <laughs> that's what I know. Yeah. Yeah. So the other question that is, uh, there are people here, they want to transition into data scientists. Yeah. So what background do you suggest? Uh, we see people coming into data science from all backgrounds. The primary things, and since this young lady asked the question, the primary things are that you understand some of the math and stats that are in behind. Because 
just saying, hey, I'm going to run a prediction. You don't know how accurate it is. You need, where the, you need to know where the guardrails are. So data science involves learning stats and math to some degree. It involves some programming capabilities and then the ability to put those two together. And so the R language is a very good starting point because it's taught in all the universities, well not all, but a lot of the universities as a way to go learn those topics. Not the only way, but a very useful way. So I, for you, I would suggest go take the R course. Um, uh, I'm hiring a guy right now, and he doesn't know R at all. He's coming up the learning curve like this very fast, because it's not a difficult language if you have a background in programming. Are you still going to put up that slide? Okay. I'll put it up. It's really long. It's probably best I get it to uh, our hosts and have them distribute that to you, if that'd be all right. Um, I mean, you can, you can just go out on Coursera and type data science and type R, and you'll get the responses. Look for um, Johns Hopkins and look for Stanford. Was that came out of the bioinformatics program? That is an absolute killer. They use R for about half of their examples. And then there's uh, datacamp.com. I can't remember if it's Comernet. It's, it's Comernet. Look up Datacamp. And they have an R course that actually uses Revolution R as the basis of the course. And that'll take you through. One thing that's different about a product open source R always runs in memory. And we do everything open source does, so we run in memory. But we also run on disk and run on remote systems. So you need to take a little bit of training to help understand we're dealing now with multiple data contexts instead of one. And the same is true of H2O and everybody else that can run remotely in Spark versus locally. Okay, so there's lots of education. We'll get that to you guys. More questions? Way back. One more question. To get around the memory issue, have you guys considered running on Mesos? Well, we have. Um, Spark actually runs on Mesos. Um, we, haven't, we haven't seen a big upswing. Mesos is a distributed computing platform that is really a little more tuned towards uh, distributed high-performance computation than big data. It's really a more high, like simulation type problems, weather simulation, than it is a big data platform. Spark runs on Mesos. Uh, when we run Spark, we'll probably run on Hadoop Spark, which is Spark layered over Hadoop. Mesos is a little farther off. Guys, we got to cut out. I got to get him to the airport. But thank you very much. Well, Tom and I are local. I left some cards up at the table out there, but you can reach us through Dev and some of the other folks that are here that are hosting the event. So, if you need anything answered, just just let us know. We're just out in Las Vegas. Thank you. Anybody's got those USB sticks running around? Let's. I still want to gather those things and keep them updated with the latest stuff. Got the other one running around?